I am doing my PhD on sea rise impacts on enanga spawning sites. Um, so just thinking about what I was going to present to you today, I've just started um, and haven't done much. Um, I've been up here for a couple of months now doing some field work and meeting all the mana whenua of our lovely awa. Um, so my first, uh, I've got a couple, three kaupapa. Uh, my first one is just to talk about why I'm looking at sea level rise in Inanga spawning sites. Um, I'm also going to let you know where I, what I've been up to and who I've met, etc, etc. Um, but at the last part, I've actually got a few, uh, a few questions for all of our lovely experts in the room here um, that we may be able to have recorded or about when I'm sitting in panel discussion. Questions for you guys. Um, so I'm looking at uh, utilising two different um, knowledge systems. So a hydrological model, which is called DAL3D, it's from the Netherlands. Um, and our own local Mātauranga Māori um, to see whether we can utilise both those knowledge systems to make better management decisions for our inanga and our inanga spawning sites. Uh, so, why sea level rise? Well, um, if you take a look at this slide here, um, you can see that within, uh, where are we, the next 30 years, a lot of Napier um, is going to be under, under water level based on some of the predictions that um, our international experts are making about our sea levels. Um, and that we all know climate change is happening, it's getting more on land and in our ocean. And what's happening in our oceans is that our water, as it heats up, it expands. Um, and so do, do our um, ice sheets um, that are melting in the north and south pole of the world. Um, so global predictions uh, of sea level rise increase is 0.26 to 0.82 metres, but actually we're probably looking at more like 0.46 to 1.05 metres in Aotearoa, and that's based on local variables, local differences, um, and some of our um, southern hemisphere weather patterns. Um, and that's by 2100. So this is Napier, and this is Wairoa. So the reason why I'm showing you these two is because the two rivers that I'm looking at is uh, the, the Clive, or the old Narururu, which is at the bottom of this map, which you can't quite see. Oh. Yep, so around here, um, and the Wairo River, um, which you can see there, and with this map, it doesn't look like there's going to be much of a difference in terms of sea, sea level rise, but as we know, the township of Wairo is pretty much at the mouth, and we've got one of are living right at the mouth as well, so sea level rise in its entirety is going to be an issue. Sea level rise for Inanga. Um, so, not sure if you guys know, but Inanga have a pretty complex life cycle and they like um, chilling out and um, spawning or having their babies and laying their eggs um, at the freshwater, oops, sorry, at the freshwater, saltwater, what we call the saltwater wedge. So, this is a river, the freshwater is coming downstream. And this is the tidal raging from the ocean that's pushing the, the more denser salt water underneath the fresh water. So Eno kind of like this little surf, this little e area here. Um, and what that looks like within the two rivers that I'm looking at is kind of around, dependent on the season, but kind of around here is where the salt water wedge is. And for Wairua, very interesting, 40k upstream. You can see salt water 
And so that's all the way up, getting really, really close to Fraser Town. Um, and so, you know, speaking with some of the some of the locals there, you know, some of the kids that go swimming around Fraser Town can still taste the saltiness. So, um, what we what I'm thinking for the Wairau River is that um, the Eno are actually spawning up some of the side streams, um, the Awatere, which is by Taiho Marae, and then also the Huramua, which is kind of around here. Um, there's another, that's another side stream where the um, Enanga have been found too. Um, As I said, Enanga have pretty complex lifestyles, uh, life cycle, lifestyle. Pretty childish, I guess. <laughs> um, so our, our adult Enanga spend their time in fresh water for a good six months of the year. Um, they then come down, as I said, um, down to the tidal area of the river, get up in the vegetation and start having uh, laid their eggs, have a good time at it apparently, um, and then they're there for a good month, they, they hatch on the next spring tide, come larvae and they use the flow um, from high tide to low tide to get out to the marine environment, spend six months as juvies, and then if they make it past our lovely nets and become a fritter in my puppu, <laughs> they then become, they spend the rest of their life um, up in the, in, in fresh water for another six months. Thought to have had this, this whole life cycle, probably just a year. So not very many last after the second or third year. So, so. Inanga, there's going to be an issue, right, if sea level rise is going to inundate as well as um, push the salt water upstream, that means our Inanga spawning sites are probably going to move upstream. So what I'm looking at is what are the sea level rise impacts on Inanga spawning sites in the two rivers that I said in the Hawke's Bay. I'm trying to use two different knowledge systems to make better management decisions. Um, so, my three sub-questions are where and what is the current extent of Enanga spawning sites in the two rivers in the Hawke's Bay, as well as its tributaries? What is the predicted sea level rise in those two rivers in the Hawke's Bay? And how can we utilise my Tarata Māori to make better management decisions for Enanga and the spawning site? Um, as I said, I've only just started. This is my first year and I'm a part-time person doing this, as well as trying to work and look after my two lovely children. Um, I also don't live here, I live in Wellington, so um, I've pretty much moved myself up here. Um, I've been up here nearly two months, um, leaving in June, um, just to give it some time to really meet the locals. And it's been great meeting everybody, actually. Um, so, what am I at? Where am I at? I at. That's me. Um, uh, that's the Clive. As you can see on at the top of that photo is a uh, rock wall. Enanga are not going to be spawning or making babies in those rock walls. Um, on the other side of, of it, if you can't, if, that you can't see, and that's in the client, which is oops, right here, is a spawning site that um, is currently being managed by the Regional Council with help from local experts like Hans Rock and Joella Brown, who have been able to. Um, do a little bit of surveying around here to find the eggs. So this spawning site has been used multiple decades by Enona. And so they've been managing it by cutting down trees, um, planting some of the plants that are needed um, for Enona to spawn, and excluding stock as well as other um, nasties that might have an impact on those sites. For the Wairua, there have been surveys done um, and some of the landowners have um, worked towards trying to exclude stock um, as well as doing some plantings, um, which is great. It's, it's good to see. So um, that's currently what's happening at the moment. What I'm looking at is how far up we might need to go up the Clive based on the sea level rise predictions with all of the salt water coming in, how, how far up river we might need to go and, and kind of just say, okay, well maybe this is where we should be looking to protect the you know, spawning sites. 
or maybe other city we should be going a little bit further. Um, what else have I been doing? Um, learning the model. I'm not a modeler. I have no idea what I'm doing in this space. Um, I'm lucky enough to have a great um, supervisor who knows exactly what she's doing. Um, so I'm kind of just finding my feet in that one at the moment. But what this one, what these two um, pictures show is on the right with the red, I need the bathymetry and the topography of the river and the surrounding land um, to start building a model grid, which is this one on the left, um, to help me um, make better predictions on how far up the salt water is going to actually go up these rivers. So this is wide off. Um, we're, I'm looking at flight as, as I go. So the model's going to be interesting. Um, at the moment, I'm also, the reason why I was in a kayak was because I had a salinity logger, um, chucked it in the water to see how salty the water was um, going upstream. And I had to find that wedge that I showed you. So I was looking for fresh water at the top, salty water at the bottom, kept coming downstream. Um, and that will help me to build the model, calibrate it, validate it, all of those aiding words. Um, as well as find, trying to find um, some eno that have spawned. So I came up too early. Apparently spawning season is like end of March to end of May, but actually it's more like end of April to end of June. So we're already seeing some changes happening yearly. Um, I've spoken to a lot of white baiters who said that the season was late last year. Um, probably going to be late this year. It's going to be a late start, fast finish, potentially, a lot of rain, a lot of inanga, you know, quick and fast. Um, so I've been digging in, in vegetation. Went out with Hans Brook two days ago and found some eggs. Yay! <laughs> so that's data for me. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. Um, and then on the Mātou Dunga side, so I've been doing quite a bit of research and a lot of it is literature driven. So um, as much as um, I'm annoyed about how our old and Pākehā have created our myths and legends about our Atua, they have been, um, they were the only ones that held onto the knowledge pre-colonisation. So, um, I've been able to utilise some of the information by Best, by Smith, um, to have a look at um, what Mātauranga we actually have about Inanga. The problem is, is that we all know colonisation created a great gap in our Mātauranga, and so now what I need to do is take this Mātauranga and ground truth it, start talking to our peeps, see what we know about um, about our Mātauranga. Is it still alive? Are we still using it? All of those questions are still relevant. How does it evolve? Will it evolve? How do we utilise it for climate change? All of those questions I'm super interested in having. So most of this is about what you guys know. Um, so, whakapapa um, in bests, as well as other um, whakapapa. Um, Inanga is attached to Rehua. So Rehua is our and the Antares star in the Scorpio constellation, which is this guy here. Got two wives, you can see on each slide. Um, and what I know is that the reason why the Whakapapa with Inanga and is with Rehua is when Rehua appears in the dawn, which is our summer star, all of these animals are active in some way or form. So Inanga, when Rehua appears, is starting to move, is starting to get ready to come down and have babies. These other ones, I'm not sure actually, these ones might be making more noise. The Piharanga cricket, the Tatarakihi cicada might be making more noise, might be ready to have babies too. So I've just got to sort out, you know, what kind of activity that's looking like. Um, the other Mātauranga that I'm looking at is our Fitu, our Maramataka, so our Fitu, YT, which is our freshwater star in the Matariki constellation. Um, we use to identify whether it's going to be a good fishing year by its brightness or, or its dullness. So that's one that I'm having a look at, as well as our uh, moon phases throughout our month. When are they more active? Apparently they're more active in our full moon, but it might have been just because we couldn't see back in those days and our full moon was our light. So I've got to drill into all of that as well. 
Uh, and then my last part, I'm going to finish it with you right here. Um, the question that I'm really interested in is how do we ensure our masaranga is acknowledged and understood and trusted when it is used in resource management and environmental settings? Good quarter all that we had with the panel this morning is quite relevant. Um, are Huda Co still relevant today now that we have adopted technologies that allow us to remember things? So our Pudako we use as a way of transmitting our knowledge, right, through the generations. Um, and so now that we kind of don't, we don't do that all the time, and we, we are doing it, but we're not doing it all the time. We are using different technologies to be able to hold some of this information. Are they still relevant? And if they are, how do we make them more relevant in a day where, where technologies are becoming a way more um, interesting piece. How would you recommend we validate Mātauranga that hasn't had the opportunity to evolve due to colonisation? So, um, our Pūrāko were developed back in the day. Because of colonisation, they haven't had the chance to evolve, so we've got a lot of Pūrāko that might have um, been quite important back then, but may not have changed with our changing climate. So, how do we then validate that? Um, and then, when is it okay to use Western tools to analyse our mātauranga? So, a very good conversation this morning around the use of our mātauranga. Um, a lot of science tries to pull in mātauranga and put it into their frameworks and their borders, their structures, which seems like a round, cold, square head type thing. So, but there are some instances where Western tools are going to be um, beneficial for us to use. So we know we, when can we utilise this in to, to analyse that. Um, last slide, just want to say um, big mahi to everybody that I've met to date, um, including my supervisors, I have four of them, Shay Smith is one of them, um, the Taifinoas that I've met of Wairoa and um, also Joella Brown, and then um, the Kōhu Pātaki Marae peeps, um, everybody else that I've met, Hans Brook, um, who is the expert in Inanga at the moment, and will be for a little while, Mahiatu um, Kia, Joella, and her whanau um, in this time, um, and also my family, so I'm staying with my brother Hero in Teradale, my other brother came up to help me um, do some volunteering, so I'll acknowledge them, as well as my two children who I've dragged up um, <laughs> to, to be here with me. So, kia ora koutou.